you know, it's not like adolescents aren't confused about sex and their identity. That's what adolescence is, is confusion about sex and identity. You know, and generally what happens... confusion about everything. What do I do? Who am I? Yeah, exactly. And no wonder, right? Because you have a lot of choices ahead of you. And, right. and it's a tumultuous time. There's a lot of neurological reorganization. Mm -hmm. And so... So it's too many choices. Well, look, there's a huge literature on consumer choice. So let's say, you, you might ask yourself, how many shampoos do you want to go look at when you're shopping? One, five, or 300? Five. Five, exactly. Why not 300? Because one of those 300 is the best. Diminishing returns on my investment. Of That's time. for yeah. sure. That's for sure. And like, how are you going to evaluate 300 items for quality? You're just, no matter which one you pick, you've made a mistake. <laughs> you know, when you go into Subway and you say, they say, how do you want your sandwich? Like, I want you to figure that out. That's why I'm <laughs> paying for it. You know, if I have to make every sandwich decision, I might as well make it. <laughs> So, right. so people drown in choice very rapidly. Right. Talk so, about anxiety, you know, right? Yes, exactly. Well, that is anxiety. It's terrible anxiety. And too many choices is anxiety. Hmm. So, and it isn't like, I, it's not like I know the answer to how much yeah. choice about your gender you should have. But I think that, you know, we, we need to recognize that there's wide variation in personality within women and within men, even though there are differences, and mostly men and women overlap, by the way. So we're more the same than we are different, except at the extremes, and that matters. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're low in agreeableness enough, one in a hundred, let's say, you're way more likely to be in prison. And so that's males. Mm -hmm. So there are not very many women in prison compared to men, and that's because at the extremes, there's a huge preponderance of aggressive men, physically aggressive men, even though at the middle point, there's a lot of overlap. People don't understand this. Maybe maybe then the, the other side of the question is then, why are people so offended so easily? I think there's m more difficulty for each side to speak to each other, people to use the right terminology and words and not offend someone than ever too. So why are, why are people seemingly more easily offended? Are That's they? a really good question. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to say because people have been offended for a long time. The moral majority was offended for a long time in the eighties, you know, I mean, and there was plenty of censorship and that sort of thing. I, Again, it's one of those things that's very difficult to track across time. Mm -hmm. It might be that we're exposed to more things that offend us now. I mean, yeah. you go on the net, you, if you can't find something to be offended by, you're not trying right. very hard. Well, that, right. that could just be it, right? I mean, imagine that we never want to underestimate the, the impact of insane technological transformation. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can see everything mm -hmm. all the time about anything. And so I don't know if people are more easily offended or if there's just way more offensive things. So maybe it's a matter of just reducing the amount of options, reducing exposure. I mean, is this a remedy for clarity, for less um, volatility, less offensive, less, less chance to be offended? Well, who knows, right? I mean, Twitter seems to be a good way of being offended um, continually. And and offending, yeah. And, you know, that might be a consequence of its structure. It's limited. It's, it makes, it seems to reward impulsivity. It seems to transmit bad better than good mm -hmm. quite rapidly. We don't know what these technologies do to people or to communication. Mm. Um, maybe, so I don't know if people are more easily offended than they used to be. They're offended about different things. More things. Because yeah. there's more things. Possibly, possibly. I mean, it's been interesting to see what's happened with, with sex over the course of my lifetime. I mean, in the 60s, there was this idea, and it was probably the consequence of the birth control pill, that, well, maybe sex is, is free, right? It's free and easy. It, because, well, now pregnancy wasn't necessarily a consequence, and venereal disease was reasonably well under control, and so wasn't a blatant threat, certainly not a fatal one. Mm. And so people thought, well, hmm. why not free love? Hmm. Well, I hmm. think the reason for that is it's complete rubbish. 
there's no free sex. It's too dangerous. And so, so what's happened is that- From an emotional is, standpoint? Are you speaking about from an emotional standpoint or physically? Physically and socially. Well, think of consent. Okay, when can you give consent? Well, You're saying the what answer age? is we don't know. No, or under like what conditions? Well, what constitutes consent? Exactly. A whim? Yes. What if you change your mind? What if you're intoxicated? What if you're stoned? What if you're upset? What mm. if you feel you've been manipulated? Mm. Mm. You know, I mean, because the issue of consent is not, if the act is serious, and you can debate about whether or not that is, and people have their differences of opinion, it's certainly emotionally significant in all likelihood. So if it's significant, well, then consent is important. Well, what constitutes consent? Well, marriage does. So that's where sex was encapsulated fundamentally because the consent was never an issue. I mean, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of things that weren't an issue because of that. And it wasn't like it was a magical solution to everything. But so, you know, because in the 60s, the idea was that sex could be casual. Well, AIDS pretty much put the end to that idea, at least in part, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it definitely spread as a consequence of promiscuity. That was definitely one of the driving factors that sure. put AIDS everywhere. So that was not so good, to put it mildly. And then the reaction on campuses is, well, what constitutes consent? And the reason that has become questionable is because it's questionable, unless it's not serious. But, mm. you know, mm, mm. I don't think that people really believe that. Mm. So they might wish they believed it. But there's plenty of emotional damage yeah. done as a consequence of too quick intimacy. I think that's generally the case because in a partnership that becomes intimate, there's usually one person who's more emotionally invested than the other. Probably almost, almost all. inevitably, yes. I, mean, I think inevitably in every situation. Well, pretty much, yeah, 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 pretty much. And they can still be very high, but someone's still going to be more than the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. kind of leads to the, the, the conversation about individuality being the way out of ideological traps. And, and the question is, how, how and what are the ways to know who you are? Because I, I don't think it's as easy as it sounds. Like, who it's are impossible. you? It's impossible. People are really complicated. <laughs> yeah. You're way more complicated than anything else except another person, right? You're the most complicated thing that exists. Then put two complicated people together and... Yeah, well, you know, hopefully they can help each other sort themselves out, at least to some degree. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're to be self-aware completely is just not possible because, mm -hmm. you know, what we try to do to understand ourselves is limit what we'll do. And you do that to other people too. You say, well, I know you, and then you punish them if they do things you don't understand. That way they stay in the box you put them in. And there's downside to that and an upside. You know, It's part of the social contract not to do outrageous things, although you could. So we all abide by these rules and that simplifies us a lot. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's part of being polite is you don't want the bank teller to be complex. You want them to be polite and simple. Mm -hmm. So your limited understanding is sufficient. And we do that with each other all the time except when we're emotional. How do you find the individuality, your uniqueness, your specialness? Well, that probably manifests itself to a large degree in what you're interested in. Which is difficult yeah. to know. I, I think that's also difficult to know. I felt like it took into my mid thirties before I'm like, oh yeah, I'm really interested in these things. Mm -hmm. Were you interested in all sorts of things? Sure, yeah. yeah. When I was young, I did all sports. I, you know, then be, was a teenager, but it wasn't until I was really in my thirties that I really, really realized how much I enjoyed art, how much I enjoyed, you know, creating and artistic things, how much I enjoyed nature, how much I enjoyed traveling in, uh, alone time. Cause I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, so it wasn't until I was in my mid thirties till I figured that out so to me, that creates some of my individuality. That's my, that's, that's who I am. But how do people, how do people figure that out so that they know who they are? So they don't fall into ideological traps. 
Well, so the first question is, is knowing yourself the way out of an ideological trap? Well, it is to some degree because one size doesn't fit all, right? So you have to be aware of how you differ. Mm-hmm. And I, that does take a long time to figure out who you are because you're complicated. Mm-hmm. So it might not be that surprising at all that it took you till your mid thirties before you started to have some sense of who you really were, because it's Mm -hmm. people are very hard to understand. It's, and we don't have a good vocabulary, generally speaking for analyzing differences in people. I mean, the the personality test I described is a step in that direction, Mm -hmm. but it's that lexicon, that vocabulary still isn't popularly established, let's say. So it isn't part of the conversations mm-hmm. we have about other people, except accidentally. Um, mm-hmm. I produce this other mm-hmm. technology at self-authoring mm-hmm. that helps people write about their past, analyze their faults and their virtues, and write a plan for the future. It's yeah. a useful way of figuring out who you are. You kind of have to hit yourself against the world, but you know, you tell the story about your past and that, that helps you understand where you came from. You figure out your virtues and your faults. That sort of helps you understand your strengths and weaknesses. And then a plan gives you a course for the future. It's hard to do all that writing, but it's hard to blunder through life too without a plan. So it's hard either way. Pick your hard. So, you always talk about that. Choose your choose choose the difficult. The difficult will choose you eventually, and you might not like it as much, right? Yeah, well, yep. when it's necessary, like I wouldn't say to go to go out of your way necessarily to make your life difficult, but if you have a difficult choice in front of you and it's either abandon what you're you know you should be doing or do the difficult thing, well, mm-hmm. you're going to pay a price for abandonment. So and I guess I would also say that to uh, to understand yourself it's quite useful to try to not lie as you tangle yourself up in your own lies. People think they can get away with lying, but we, you can't get away with falsifying the structure of the world. 